LucasArts was founded in 1982 as Lucasfilm Games. After his success with Star Wars, George Lucas wanted to expand his entertainment empire and so Lucasfilm Games was created to be the video game development branch of his film production company Lucasfilm Limited. In this video we'll be looking at their journey from conception up until 2000, but I won't be mentioning every release. Instead, we'll look at the games that were either particularly noteworthy or that were personal favourites of mine. Originally collaborating with Atari, who helped fund Lucasfilm Games' birth, Atari would publish their games to the Atari system, with Activision and Epix publishing their games to computers. During this initial period, Lucasfilm Games was unable to develop games based on their IPs, such as the most obvious, Star Wars, because they had sold the rights to other developers before Lucasfilm Games was conceived. Lucasfilm could make money by licensing out Star Wars, while avoiding the risk involved with funding a game's development, much in the same way that Disney is currently doing with Star Wars games. This led to their first releases being action games, the first of which being Ball Blazer. Ball Blazer was released in March 1984, initially on the Atari and later ported to computers such as the Commodore 64, Spectrum and Amstrad CPC. Ball Blazer is a one-on-one -on -one futuristic sports game in which each side controls a craft which must carry a floating ball into their opponent's goal. The action takes place on a checkerboard playing field and from a first-person viewpoint. Their second game was Rescue on Fractalus, which was also released in March 1984, again on the Atari and various home computers. Again from a first person perspective, this time the player controls a space fighter, attempting to rescue downed pilots from the mountainous terrain of an alien planet. Various complications arise, as the harsh atmosphere of the planet allows the pilots to remain outside for less than a minute, and their beacons are often out of sight, so the player must use the direction finder to locate them. Night missions are especially troublesome, as the player has to make good use of the altimeter to avoid crashing into mountains. Flying also uses up fuel, which can be replenished through the rescue of pilots who will bring their fuel supplies on board. The player also has to contend with anti-aircraft guns and the enemy aliens called Jaggies fly kamikaze flying saucers. Another interesting mechanic actually suggested by George Lucas is that some of the downed pilots will be aliens in disguise. In 1986 came their first licensed game and first adventure game, Labyrinth based on Lucasfilm's movie starring David Bowie and numerous Jim Henson puppets. Published by Activision on various home computers, Labyrinth the Computer Game is a graphic adventure wherein the player must navigate a maze while solving puzzles and avoiding danger. The aim is to locate and destroy Jareth within 13 real-time hours. During its development, the team spent a week brainstorming with Douglas Adams of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame, who had considerable influence over the finished product. Project leader David Fox disliked the typical structure of text adventures whereby you had to basically type words in a sort of verbal guessing game which any 70s or 80s kids will remember very well and so he created the word wheel menus to replace this system. Labyrinth's design was a huge influence on Lucasfilm's next adventure game, Maniac Mansion. Maniac Mansion was released in October 1987 on various home computers including the Commodore 64, an Amiga, Atari ST, IBM PC and also on the NES. Again a graphic adventure, Maniac Mansion was the first game to be both developed and published by Lucasfilm Games as EA had reportedly scoffed at the game saying it wouldn't sell. The story revolves around Dave as he attempts to rescue his girlfriend from mad scientist Dr. Fred and his mansion of crazed relatives, the Edisons. The player controls three of six possible characters and can switch between them at any time. The game requires different approaches depending upon which combination of characters is selected. The game was conceptualised in 1985 by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick who wanted to create a comedy based on horror and B-movies. The huge turning point for the game and for future Lucasfilm adventure games was the creation of the SCUM interface. Ron Gilbert didn't like the traditional text-based systems in adventure games and so created his own engine called the Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion, abbreviated to SCUM. The interface works by the player clicking on various commands such as Walk To and Pick Up on a menu positioned at the bottom of the screen to move the characters and manipulate objects. It's been said that Ron Gilbert was the father of graphic adventure games but this really isn't the case he had, however, just invented the point-and-click adventure game 
which became the standard for the genre going forward. Lucasfilm management had very little involvement with Maniac Mansion's development, a factor which Gilbert attributes much of the game's success, and this was a trend with the company going forward. Gilbert and Winnick focused heavily on the game's story and characters, and the game featured cutscenes, a term actually coined by Ron Gilbert, to inform the player of plot details happening off screen. Maniac Mansion received huge critical acclaim and was cited as a big step towards games becoming a credible storytelling art form. Next up is another graphic adventure, the bizarrely titled Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. The second game to use the Scum engine, Zack McCracken was released in October 1988 on various home computers including the Commodore 64 and DOS and saw a Amiga and Atari ST ports the following year. The plot, set in 1997, follows journalist Zack and his colleagues as they strive to prevent aliens from slowly reducing the intelligence of every human on Earth. Another ancient alien race have left a device with which to repel the aliens, which must be assembled. Alas, said device's parts are scattered across Earth and Mars. Initially intended to be serious, the storyline was altered to be a comedy and is based upon many popular alien conspiracy theories. In June 1989, Lucasfilm released Pipe Dream, which is a port of the arcade and Amiga puzzle game Pipe Mania. Lucasfilm brought Pipe Dream to various home computers, including the BBC which I first played it on, and later the NES and Game Boy. Gameplay consists of simply connecting various differently shaped pieces of pipe together on a grid within a given time limit. Those who haven't played the game may recognise the gameplay though, as it has since appeared as a minigame in countless titles, often as a hacking minigame or whatnot. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade The Graphic Adventure, not to be confused with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade The Action Game released the same year, was released in July 1989 for DOS, Amiga, Atari ST and Mac, and later other platforms, and is the third game to use the Scum engine. The Last Crusade was released to coincide with the release of the film, and built upon traditional adventure games by adding additional gameplay mechanics such as multiple methods of completing the game, thus adding replay value to a genre that often lacked it. The plot closely follows that of the film, and features many unique scenes that were first conceived by George Lucas and Steven Spielberg when they were making the film. The game was the first game using the Scum Engine to include the commands Look and Talk. The Talk command would allow the player to choose from several lines of dialogue, but was simple in design, although became fully realised in later Lucasfilm adventure games. Now we step into the glory days of Lucasfilm games, the early to mid 90s, well certainly for me anyway, as some of my all time favourite games feature here. Lucasfilm games became one of the top two pioneers of the adventure game genre, along with Sierra Online. In 1990, Lucasfilm restructured its companies, and Lucasfilm games became part of the new LucasArts Entertainment Company, along with Industrial Light and Magic and Skywalker Sound. The latter two later merged into Lucas Digital Limited, and the former Lucasfilm games became simply LucasArts. The first game we'll look at in this era is Loom, released in May of 1990. Loom is a fantasy graphic adventure and the fourth game to use the Scum Engine, although didn't use the verb object interface of the previous three games. Gameplay instead centres around the use of four note musical tunes known as drafts, which the protagonist Bobbin Threadbare plays on his distaff, a stick used for spooling wool. Each draft is a spell which performs a certain action such as open, Bobbin can learn new drafts by observing the action related to that spell, and can later perform more complex drafts by learning notes beyond the initial C, D and E. To be frank, I never got on well with Loom, but it's an interesting concept and quite the departure from traditional graphic adventures, so definitely worth a look if you're curious. Next up is another point and click adventure game, the fifth to use the Scum Engine, and one of LucasArts most well known, The Secret of Monkey Island. Released in October 1990 for DOS, Amiga, Atari ST, and also the Mega CD in Japan and Sega CD in North America, The Secret of Monkey Island takes place in the Caribbean during the height of piracy. The player controls young protagonist Guybrush Threepwood, who has aspirations of becoming a mighty pirate as he traverses several fictional islands. The game was first conceptualised in 1988 by Ron Gilbert, who designed the game alongside Tim Schafer and Dave Grossman. Focusing heavily on exploration, Gilbert made it almost impossible for the player's character to die. 
The game is based upon the Pirates of the Caribbean Disney theme park ride and is absolutely hilarious. Few games before or since have been able to capture the wit that the development team injected into the game. The game's world and characters were mainly designed by Gilbert, with Schaefer and Grossman co-writing the game's plot. The scum interface was also heavily modified to make it more user friendly. The talk to command also now opened up a dialogue tree and was the first game to employ this system. The game starts with Guybrush arriving on Melee Island with the intention of becoming a pirate. He soon finds himself undertaking three tasks for the island's head pirates and later falls head over heels in love with the island's governor Elaine Marley and battling the evil ghost pirate LeChuck. Another fantastic and famous part of the game is the insult sword fights. Guybrush must take part in numerous sword fights in which the victor is not the one with the sharpest cutlass but with the sharpest tongue. The player learns new comebacks by fighting pirates in encounters on the island's pathways until he has a witty enough repartee of insults and comebacks with which to fight the island's legendary swordmaster. The Secret of Monkey Island is a culmination of fantastic elements that make it a masterpiece. The music sets the scene perfectly, the puzzles are taxing but not overly complex, the characters are interesting and varied, and the humour is second to none when it comes to video games. I'd thoroughly recommend it to anyone, and the first two Monkey Island games have been remastered and are available on several modern platforms. Anyone interested in the series can check out my 10 Monkey Island Facts video. Moving into 1991, we reach a period in which LucasArts changed their logo, introducing what is known as the Gold Guy logo, which they used up until 2005. The original Lucasfilm Games logo was based on the film company's logo and had numerous variations. The new Gold Guy logo design was a gold figure standing on a purple letter L. The figure has his hands raised with what looks like a sun's rays emanating from behind it, sometimes likened to an eye. Also during this period, the Star Wars licensing deals ended and so were available to use for the first time. In November 1991 came Star Wars on the NES, which was later ported to the Game Boy and Sega's Master System and Game Gear consoles. The game follows the storyline of the film, featuring platforming levels as well as levels where the player controls various vehicles. The player controls not only Luke, but several other Star Wars characters, each with their own unique abilities. While working at LucasArts in the early 1990s, composers Michael Land and Peter McConnell developed an interactive music system for video games called iMuse. iMuse, or Interactive Music Streaming Engine, synchronised the music with the action taking place on screen and allowed different pieces of music to transition seamlessly. This was a godsend as it allowed the music to flow uninterrupted when the player wandered from one area to another which would often feature different pieces of music. The iMuse system was added to the SCUM engine in 1991 and the first game to use it was the sixth game to employ the SCUM engine, Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge. Monkey Island 2 is the sequel to the fantastic secret of Monkey Island and was a huge step up both graphically and in scale. Released in December 1991 on Amiga, Mac, DOS and FM Towns, the game came on a whopping 11 discs on the Amiga, the system on which I first experienced the game. The development team was largely unchanged from the first game, with project leader Ron Gilbert being once again joined by Tim Schafer and Dave Grossman. Again centering around aspiring pirate Guybrush Threepwood, the game's story continues after Guybrush's defeat of LeChuck in the first game. Set in a tri-island area, again in the Caribbean, Guybrush is on a quest to locate the mysterious treasure of Big Whoop. The game features graphics that were absolutely stunning for the time and was one of the few adventure games to offer a choice of difficulty level, the regular version and the tamer Monkey 2 Lite which omitted many of the harder puzzles entirely. On the back of the box the developers take the piss by saying that this mode was intended for video game reviewers. The game's epic story culminates in a bizarre ending which I won't spoil, which is left to interpretation by the player. Ron Gilbert has stated that he had a clear vision for what this ending meant, although it's unlikely that we'll ever see a true third game in the series as Gilbert's involvement in Monkey Island ended with this game. He has however recently tweeted Disney saying that he has cash ready if they were ever willing to license out the franchise, so I will continue to hope. The next game to use the Scum Engine and newly introduced iMuse system was Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Another point-and-click adventure released in June of 1992, again on DOS, Amiga, Mac and FM Towns. 
Less than a year later, it saw a re-release on CD-ROM featuring full voice acting and digitised sound effects. The plot follows Indy and his ex-archaeologist colleague, Sophia Hapgood, as they search for the lost sunken city of Atlantis while, of course, being pursued by Nazis. The game features three unique game modes. The Team Path, in which Indy is supported by Sophia, the Wits Path, that offers numerous complex puzzles, and the Fists Path, which features action sequences and is heavily centred around fist fighting. Unlike many other LucasArts adventure games, it is possible for the player character to die. The game was well received critically and went on to sell over a million units. Next up in November 1992 was Super Star Wars, the SNES and Super Famicom equivalent of the NES's Star Wars. The game features mainly run and gun gameplay, but again has several vehicle levels. The game also saw sequels, Super Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back in 1993 and Return of the Jedi in 1994. Moving swiftly on to another Star Wars game, and the first in a series that is one of my favourites on the PC, Star Wars X-Wing. The first Star Wars DOS game released by LucasArts, X-Wing is a combat flight simulator in which the player pilots several rebel starfighters, such as the titular X-Wing. From what I remember, the control scheme was rather complex and so took some learning, as many keyboard commands had to be learned to successfully pilot the ships. The storyline runs parallel with the first Star Wars game, the player controlling a rebel pilot as he fights the Empire. X-Wing was one of the first games to use 3D polygon graphics, and was the first non-adventure game to employ the IMU system. The game includes briefings and cutscenes, with missions taking place exclusively in space. There are three tours of duty, consisting of 12 to 14 ops each, and are made up of missions such as dogfights, escorts and convoy attacks, amongst others. The game's climax sees the player controlling Luke Skywalker as he leads the assault on the Death Star. X-Wing became a bestseller and received huge critical acclaim. I'm hopeful that the series will be revisited in the future, as the first person space shooter series would be right at home on a virtual reality platform. Heading into 1993 and back to the adventure game genre, next up is Day of the Tentacle. Also known as Maniac Mansion 2 Day of the Tentacle, Day of the Tentacle is a graphic adventure released in June 1993 on DOS and Mac, and is obviously the sequel to the 1987 hit Maniac Mansion. The plot follows Bernard and his friends Hogan and Laverne as they attempt to prevent the evil purple tentacle from taking over the world. Similar to the gameplay in Maniac Mansion, the player controls all three characters and can switch between them at will, although this time there is an added element, the three characters are across different time periods. Gameplay takes place within the same house, but whereas Bernard is in the present, Hoagie is flung 200 years into the past and Laverne 200 years into the future. This allows for a brilliant gameplay mechanic, as actions performed in the past and present will affect things in the present and future which therefore requires some considerable thinking when solving puzzles. For the first time, Tim Schafer and Dave Grossman led the development team. Day of the Tentacle is the eighth game to use the Scum engine and features some fantastic humour reminiscent of the previous Monkey Island games. It was released on Floppy and CD-ROM simultaneously, the latter featuring a talky version with voice acting much like Indiana Jones did. The game also features a fully playable version of Maniac Mansion due to the cutscenes in Day of the Tentacle being limited to 64k, the size of the entire Maniac Mansion game, and so was popped in as an easter egg. The game's graphics are stunning and very cartoony, taking visual inspiration from Chuck Jones cartoons. The storyline is based on American history, although somewhat loosely, particularly the Founding Fathers and Birth of the US Constitution. Another of my all-time favourite games is one that keeps me coming back again and again, most recently the 2016 remaster which is available on several platforms, so I'd recommend you check it out. Developed alongside Day of the Tentacle and released in September 1993 was Zombies Ate My Neighbours, released on Mega Drive and SNES. Sadly, due to ridiculous censorship, the name was shortened to Zombies in PAL Territories, which is a crying shame as its full title is so brilliant. For want of a better description, Zombies is a run and gun game wherein one or two players control Zeke or Julia as they strive to rescue the titular neighbours from various horror movie monsters. Various weapons and power ups are available, although much of the horror movie violence was censored along with the name in PAL versions. Zombies is quite different to other LucasArts games and is great fun, so well worth picking up on SNES or Mega Drive if you have one. 
Continuing with the spate of Star Wars games, Star Wars Rebel Assault was released in November 1993 for DOS, Mac, 3DO and Mega CD, and was LucasArts' first CD-ROM only game. It became one of the company's biggest successes and was the must-have game for CD-ROM drives in the early 90s. Rebel Assault featured digitised footage and music from the original films and full speech. It was also one of the first games to utilise FMV on the PC. Video was used to display pre-rendered 3D graphics which were way ahead of anything that current PCs could render in real time. The graphics wowed people at the time but have not aged well. The game is an on-rail shooter whose story follows a young pilot named Rookie One as he or she fights for the Rebel Alliance against the Empire. Events take place predominantly during the timeline of the first film but also include scenes from Hoth. Gameplay is across 15 chapters and consists of three spaceflight types first person, third person and top down, and also a fourth type on foot. Sam and Max Hit the Road was released in November 1993 on DOS and Mac, again seeing simultaneous floppy and CD-ROM releases. Another adventure game but this time seeing a major overhaul in the SCUM interface. Instead of selecting from a list of verbs, the player would cycle through the verbs through clicks of the right mouse button and the inventory was moved off screen to a sub-menu which was accessed via an icon. Dialogue Tree saw a similar change whereby the player would now choose from a selection of icons instead of text, the idea being that having to read a joke before hearing it would kill the humour. Sam and Max was based on the 1989 Sam and Max comic On the Road, created by then LucasArts employee Steve Purcell who now works at Pixar. Sam and Max are the freelance police, Sam being an anthropomorphic dog and Max being some weird rabbit character. They travel across America, visiting many popular tourist destinations along the way in search of a missing Bigfoot who has disappeared from a nearby carnival. The ninth game to use the Scum engine, and again I Muse, Sam and Max features fantastic humour and received praise for its voice acting and graphics. Plans for sequels were cancelled, and the series has subsequently been passed on to Telltale Games. Although it has a few parts that involve a bit too much going back and forth between locations to fetch items, which made it slightly less enjoyable for me than, say, Day of the Tentacle or Monkey Island, Sam and Max is another adventure game from this golden era of the genre of which I have very fond memories and would thoroughly recommend you try. The second game in the X-Wing series, Star Wars TIE Fighter, was released in July 1994 on DOS and Mac. My personal favourite in the series, the game switched the gameplay to the perspective of an Imperial Starfighter pilot. Set during the events of The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, the game's story starts shortly after the Empire's victory on Hoth. The player takes part in several battles, each containing four to eight missions. As with X-Wing, it features briefings and cutscenes to assist the story's progress. Again, all battles take place in space, primarily in first-person view, but with the option to switch to third-person, with similar missions such as dogfights and escorts. TIE Fighter's gameplay, although similar in principle to X-Wing, introduces several new mechanics such as a more advanced targeting system. Particularly of note is the game's music, again making good use of the iMuse system, which takes the traditional John Williams soundtrack for the Empire and twists it to fit the perspective of the character playing as an Imperial pilot. For example, the Imperial March is altered to be a rather more heroic theme instead of having its original dark undertones. In February 1995 came another Star Wars game, Dark Forces, released on DOS and Mac and on PlayStation the following year. After the unprecedented success of id Software's Doom, LucasArts was keen to capitalise on the first person shooter trend and release Star Wars Dark Forces. The player controls character Carl Katarn, a mercenary working with the Rebel Alliance who discovers the Empire's Dark Trooper project and endeavours to destroy it. Dark Forces used the Jedi game engine, which was created solely for the game, and plays very much like Doom but set in the Star Wars universe, which can only be a good thing, right? Right. This game is awesome. I can't speak for the PlayStation port as I've never played it, but I hear that the graphics and frame rate are awful, but the DOS version is brilliant fun. Playing a Star Wars first person shooter at the time was epic, complete with familiar enemies and blaster sounds, as well as myriad familiar Star Wars environments, great cutscenes and a fantastic soundtrack that had become synonymous with LucasArts Star Wars games. The game was often called a Doom clone, but the Jedi engine added various new elements to the genre such as the ability to look up and down, jump and duck. 
Returning to the graphic adventure genre, April 1995 saw the release of Full Throttle for DOS, Mac and Windows. Full Throttle was designed by Tim Schafer and was his first game as lead writer and designer. The game's story follows Ben, the leader of a biker gang who is framed for the murder of a popular motorbike manufacturer and so must clear his name. The tenth game to use Scum, Full Throttle features full motion video and action sequences by means of a new in-house engine called Insane, short for Interactive Streaming Animation Engine. Full Throttle had an enormous budget of $1.5 million and it was the first LucasArts game to be released from Microsoft Windows, the first LucasArts adventure game to be released solely on CD-ROM and featured professional voice acting with the likes of Mark Hamill providing dialogue. In a departure from the normal SCUM interface, much like in Sam and Max, interactions with objects and characters are controlled via a Pi menu. A remastered version is currently in development by Tim Schafer's company Double Fine, who recently remastered Day of the Tentacle and is scheduled for release in 2017. Later that year, in November 1995, came another adventure game, The Dig, again for DOS and Mac. The 11th game to run on the Scum engine, The Dig again features voice acting and a digital orchestral soundtrack. The game's inspiration came originally from an idea for Steven Spielberg's Amazing Story series, but it was deemed to be too expensive to realise, and so is adapted into an adventure game. Unlike other adventure games from LucasArts, The Dig had a more serious approach when compared to its comedy-littered siblings. The story is science fiction, wherein the player controls Commander Boston Lowe, part of a five-man team tasked with planting explosives on an asteroid that is on a collision course with Earth. Upon discovering that the asteroid is hollow, Lowe and two of his team are transported into an abandoned alien complex filled with advanced technology, which they must utilise to solve various mysteries and eventually find their way home. The Dig saw the longest development period of any LucasArts game, between design team first meeting at Skywalker Ranch in 1989 and the game being released in 1995. Upon its release, The Dig became LucasArts' best-selling adventure game. April 1997 saw the release of the third instalment in the X-Wing series, with X-Wing vs TIE Fighter for Windows. It looks stunning, and as is evident from the gameplay on screen, the game featured several technological advancements over its predecessors, including texture mapping, a CD soundtrack and high-res graphics. The game was also the first in the series to require the use of a joystick. X-Wing vs TIE Fighter features a multiplayer mode for up to 8 players, but lacks a storyline, although this feature was added with the release of the expansion pack Balance of Power. In October 1997, six years after the last game, came the third game in the Monkey Island series, The Curse of Monkey Island. The twelfth and last game to use the Scum engine, The Curse of Monkey Island was quite the departure from the previous two Monkey Island games, as the series creator Ron Gilbert had ceased work on the franchise. As a result, although fun, I never had the same passion for the game, and subsequent Monkey games for that matter, as I did with the first two. It's the first Monkey Island game to include voice acting, and has a much more cartoony graphical style. The story again joins lovable buffoon Guybrush Threepwood, as he attempts to lift a curse from his beloved Elaine Marley, encountering various wacky characters along the way, as well as his old nemesis LeChuck. This time the scum interface uses a verb coin having three icons, a hand representing actions related to touch, a skull related to sight and a parrot relating to the mouth, e.g. talking. The following October in 1998 LucasArts released another adventure game for Windows, Grim Fandango. Again headed up by Tim Schafer, Grim Fandango started development shortly after the completion of Full Throttle. The game uses 3D computer graphics overlaid on pre-rendered backgrounds. The story is based upon the Mexican Day of the Dead and combines elements of the Aztec interpretations of the afterlife, 1930s art deco and aspects of film noir, and takes place in the Land of the Dead or Eighth Underworld. The player follows travel agent Manny Calavera, Calavera being Spanish for skull, as he attempts to assist Mercedes, a newly arrived soul in the underworld, on her journey. Grim Fandango lacks any on-screen display, instead informing the player of anything of interest when the cursor is passed over an object or area. A large voice acting cast was employed for the game's dialogue and cutscenes, which include many Latino actors who help with Spanish slang. 
Our story ends in November 2000 with the release of LucasArts' final original adventure game, Escape from Monkey Island, the fourth game in the series. The first Monkey game to use 3D graphics, it again failed to capture my heart in the same way as the first two games did, although it was generally well received. Using the same control scheme and engine as Grim Fandango, Escape from Monkey Island is the only non-point and click game in the Monkey Island series. This time Guybrush returns home with Elaine following their honeymoon to find that she has, in error, been declared dead and her position as governor up for election. Guybrush must find a way to restore Elaine's position as governor whilst unearthing a plot to convert the Caribbean into a tourist trap with his old enemy LeChuck as the mastermind. The game also features a new version of the iMuse system which incorporates MP3 compression as well as several other changes and many of the voice actors from The Curse of Monkey Island reprise their roles. The game saw a PS2 port the following year, making it the third LucasArts adventure game to see a console release, after Maniac Mansion on the NES and the original Monkey Island on Mega CD. After this, LucasArts decided to close down their adventure game studio, resulting in planned sequels for Full Throttle and Sam and Max being cancelled. The frustrated staff left to form their own studio, Telltale Games, which eventually obtained the rights to Sam and Max from Steve Purcell and got to make their sequel, which is jolly good as it happens. They also made the excellent Tales of Monkey Island in 2009 and are well known for their episodic adventure games such as The Walking Dead, Back to the Future and The Wolf Among Us. This is where I've chosen to end the story of LucasArts, although many games were released between 2000 and its purchase by Disney in 2012. After the acquisition, Disney shut down LucasArts after a mere 154 days, preferring instead to license out its library of game franchises to other developers. Ron Gilbert and Tim Schafer have left to form their own companies, with Tim Schafer's Double Fine remastering several LucasArts classic adventure games in recent years. So LucasArts is no more, and many of its classic IPs lay dormant, but I will always look back upon its games in the early to mid 90s as some of my fondest gaming memories when the adventure game was king and Star Wars games were fresh and exciting. Thanks for joining me on this trip down memory lane and for sharing my memories of a developer that meant a great deal to me. I'd love to hear any memories you guys have of LucasArts, what were your favourite games and what did they mean to you?